What is up, everybody? Happy Friday. So good to see you. My two favorite people to talk to are philosophers and psychologists. And most of the great philosophers are dead. So what do we have? We have a psychiatrist, psychotherapist. What do we call you, Wesley Ann Little? What do we call you? You, you can call me a therapist. I therapist. think the official term is psychotherapist, but that psychotherapist. always it sounds like a weird term. But yeah, because the word yeah. psycho's in yeah. it, right? Yeah. Okay, so I want to give our audience that are tuning in today, well, first of all, welcome. So happy to be back on this live stream. So happy to see you guys. Okay, let me give you guys some context. So I get a lot of DMs on Instagram. But every once in a while, somebody drops something on the DM that catches my eye. And I was like, this is not my usual. And that's why you and I are talking. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I, I do something I normally don't do. I say, hey, let's have a conversation. Let's just talk. Who are you? What's going on? And there's a depth to the kind of questions that you're asking me that make me think you're just not my typical designer who's looking for help. Mm -hmm. You're not asking about internships or uh, how do I get work and things like that. You, you've asked me a really profound question, which is, the way that I communicate, shouldn't we all just be doing million dollar jobs? Mm -hmm. And nobody asked that kind of question. So we're talking, I'm driving back from San Diego with my son in the car. And I tell you, I think I only have 15 minutes to talk to you. Mm -hmm. Just want to get a sense of what's going on. No expectations. I think that call lasted 90 minutes. Yeah. yeah. Now you guys know this, you know this, that I don't just give my time away. So there's a special person here. And after talking with her, she changed my mind about a lot of different things tools that I think you guys are going to find to be really helpful that you can use in your day-to-day -day personal relationships, but maybe more importantly, your professional relationships. I'm not going to hype it up too much, but you need to stick around for this episode. We're going to get right into it right now. Great. Are we ready? I'm so ready. Okay. So let's, let's just begin at the beginning. <laughs> well, with the beginning, I need to let you know that I didn't just DM you. I prepped actually for a month before oh my I God. DM'd you. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. So there's more to the so, story. Yeah, there's more to the wow, story. Okay. All right. So, so I'm a therapist, right? I'm not a designer. I don't know the first thing about design, right? I don't even know the capabilities of Adobe Photoshop or anything like that. So I was on YouTube one day trying to figure out something totally rudimentary. And I saw a future video and I was like, oh, that looks interesting. Like I, I'm kind of curious about like what, what, how to price for design. I just thought it was kind of interesting how you had said it. So I watched the video and I was just so immediately taken with you, with how you teach, with what, with, but also with, with your mission, with what you're doing. So I spent the next two weeks watching nothing but future videos. My husband thought I had lost my mind. He was like, <laughs> we, we've really invested in you being a therapist. <laughs> You're not like, this is we're like, we're on the right track, right? <laughs> You're watching a lot of hours of design videos of how to be a designer. And I'm like, I'm not watching to be a designer. I'm watching because there's something so compelling about how they are teaching people. And uh, because I was a, a good student and I watched your videos, I was like, this is not a guy who's going to play around. So I am not going to reach out to this guy <laughs> unless I really know uh, that there could possibly be something of value. And at the beginning, I think it was more just a feeling of, you know, so much of what you were talking about overlaps with my world of self-worth and how to be present, how to listen, how to take criticism, um, how to work in relationships when someone is str struggling with what you're producing. And I thought, like, that's, that's so much of my world. Um, and then I kind of thought a little bit bigger and I thought, you know, all couples therapists do, or the good couples therapists, is study how relationship actually works, right? It's not just like a mushy thing of like relationship or trust or those are nice words but what couples therapists do is they break down in granular details what is making this work and what is not making this work and so i you know part of my thinking was so much of the world the business world depends on relationships but no one ever calls a couples therapist and says hey i want to get better at relationships right <laughs> So I thought, who knows, maybe something would be interesting here to cross collaborate on this. Mm. So that's the story of how I reached out to you. Okay, that's fantastic. You shared a few things with me on that drive and we did something together. We did a role play. Mm -hmm. 
and I was just fascinated by the tools that you brought mm -hmm. that were different than the tools that I normally use. Mm -hmm. Do you remember any of that? Yeah, I do. Can you share with people like what, I don't want to reconstruct it, but just to talk about some of the things that you saw and the mm -hmm. things that you were doing. Sure. So they're really the principles that you talk about. Um, I just probably break them down a little bit differently um, because what anyone watching knows is that Chris talks to you guys about how to be present and how to listen. I think what I did in that call and what I do with my clients is that I have one goal in that conversation. So my goal in that conversation is to totally understand their world. Like that's it, that I'm just totally trying to understand them. I'm not trying to come in with an agenda at all. Do I have a big picture agenda of wellness or a healthy relationship? Yes, but I even have to put that aside. And my only goal is to completely understand as much as I can about that person. Um, and I, the role play you and I did was about someone who is stuck, a little bit stuck somewhere, right? So in, in that role play, what I wanted to do was to appreciate his dilemma because we don't get stuck unless we are torn between two things we want. And so my focus was, I just really need to understand his dilemma and I need to validate the, the values that go into the dilemma, right? Because we generally have a very good reason, we have strong values in terms of um, why we're not moving forward in a certain way, even if we don't totally understand them, we just might feel kind of stuck. Right. So that's what I did. You did it really well, I have to say. Oh, thank you. He does. Thank you. I know you said take it easy on me, but I was not taking it easy on you. And you did some things that I thought were really wonderful. I'll share one of them. When I was role playing the person that was stuck and mm -hmm. torn between these things, I think you 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 embraced it and, and you acknowledged it and you validated that that's OK. Mm -hmm. Whereas when I have my business coach hat on, it's mm -hmm. like I shred it. I shred it all the time. It's like, that's dumb. What are you doing? Mm -hmm. This is offensive. Mm -hmm. And so you came in with this really kind of warm, embracing energy that caught me off guard. And these are things that I teach people, yet maybe, you know, this is the doctor not taking his own medicine kind of thing. <laughs> I teach people to embrace the objection, to acknowledge it. Otherwise, what they keep doing is they keep driving at it and they keep repeating it. Mm -hmm. They don't feel that they're heard. Right, but I think even in that, Chris, you have a, a strong value in why you drive it because you want people to get better efficiently, right? You don't want people to waste time where they are. So you have a good reason why you, it's, you drive towards it. But yeah, I think slowing down generally helps, but. Okay, so you said something that was really interesting and kind of eye-opening to me. You asked me, what do you value? Why do you do it the way you do it? And for me, it was about speed and efficiency because I have mm -hmm. finite time and there's a hundred or a thousand people needing some help. Mm -hmm. And so I dole it out in the most efficient way that I thought. Mm -hmm. Whereas you, you take time to understand their world, mm -hmm. you validate their dilemma, and then you start to help them once they feel secure, I think. Yeah. And so on the surface, it would appear that your process and your method takes a lot more time is so inefficient. Mm -hmm. But then you challenged me and you said, do they ever do what you say? No, that was like a dagger to my heart. You guys know what I'm saying? I was like, Mr. Efficiency, how's that working out for you? You're I didn't using, say it like that. Yeah, <laughs> I know, but that's how I heard it. You, you're using my own lines on me and it bothers me. And it's effective too, which bothers me too, I guess. Do you know what I mean? I do, but you know, I, I look, this is, this is my world. I don't like you, I'm just gonna say, I just don't like you. I just want y'all to know I'm feeling really good right now. I feel really comfortable. Um, but so, but, but so my world is how do I help people, um, whatever, whatever we're putting under the umbrella of change, right? How do I help them heal or grow in the, the smallest amount of time possible? So you and I actually have the same goal. I, I'm not interested in, you know, spending someone's time and money if I can make it better or faster for them. I just know that the fastest way to do it is actually to completely slow down in the moment and abandon all agenda. Um, because they, people have to feel heard and understood to even drop out of that kind of defensive mindset, like the mindset where you're really holding 
on to your, um, I don't know if you would even call it a belief, but you're holding on to your agenda. To drop that, you, the body actually has to relax. Um, so for the body to relax, you have to feel like the person in front of you actually sees you and cares about you and understands what you're going through and doesn't think you're a moron, right? I'm sure you don't make anyone feel that way, Chris. But <laughs> You're describing my brand to the T. <laughs> but but this, isn't, this isn't just for when you're working with someone. It's also for clients, too, I think. Like, I, I think of this as, can you appreciate the client's dilemma? Can you go in slowly and like really, really understand like if they if they're waffling on spending more, like what what is in that dilemma for them? Oh, oh okay, hold on. I need to put a mark on that. And we're gonna maybe we're gonna try your technique okay. and talking about a price objection. Because okay. we have an international audience and design is not loved everywhere. It's mm -hmm. not treated with respect and mm -hmm. there's acrimonious relationship, it feels very confrontational mm -hmm. so I want to get into that mm -hmm. but before I do mm -hmm. I do want to talk about I, I want to kind of recap what I learned from you okay okay and I'll just say it very plainly to probably to that camera is this is that I put in my mind people into two categories in this instance where I'm giving free advice and I'm trying to help and I have it, what I see in my mind is a line of people I got to get through yeah sometimes 10 20 100 deep and I have to do it so fast. But when I work with clients, I slow down. Mm -hmm. They're paying me. It's, they're getting my undivided attention. So I'm not in the same kind of rush. Yeah. And so it, it was a mindset switch. And, and we talk about this all the time. If you're working with your clients, don't try to close the sale. Don't try to overcome the objection so quickly because people need to be heard. Mm -hmm. In the book Socratic Selling, it's called full value listening. And what that really means is everything the client says or the person says is valuable and important. So you take notes and you listen and you just ask questions so that they could feel like they're heard mm -hmm. and that's really important to them. And it's, it mirrors exactly what you're saying. Mm -hmm. I just mm -hmm. have not been applying it to this broad audience where I have to answer questions in the most efficient ninja kind of way that I do. Mm -hmm. So if you guys want to strengthen your relationships with your clients, think about this that you need to slow down, that this is a valuable relationship and they do have a lot of power and leverage and for you to try to rush through it is probably hurting you and actually a waste of time. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think some, I, I would guess, you guys can tell me, but I would think sometimes what speeds up people who are talking to clients is an anxiety about wanting them to know that they're getting it quickly, that they're, um, that they're understanding, you know, the scope of it quickly, that they're an expert in what they're talking about. Like I, I would guess that would amp up people to some speed. So I think part of, part of how to slow down is to really anchor your mind into this place of the most valuable thing I have for them right now is just understanding them. Like that is the most valuable thing I can give them right now. Later, there's going to be other valuable things, right? But understanding them right now is the most valuable part of this work. What are three things to get really tactical that you can do to demonstrate to the other human being that my attention is on you and I'm trying to understand you? So I think of this in terms of both skill and energy. So hopefully when I go into the energy stuff, it makes sense and it doesn't sound like too woo-woo. But you know when you sit with someone and like you can kind of feel their energy, right? You can feel if they're like amped up or scattered or grounded, like you can kind of sense that. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So part of it is coming in with a grounded energy. So, you know, don't have five cups of coffee and run late and go into a client meeting because you're going to be very anxious. So. I think, Chris, actually, you take this to a whole other level. Um, I think you actually help people in this way, too. But part of it is developing a lifestyle where you are more grounded in general, right? So if I have clients who are anxious and I'm like, you know, you think you might want to lose the Red Bulls? And they're like, no, because I need it to stay awake. And I'm like, OK, so we're creating a cycle where you're not actually living like a balanced life. So as much as someone can do to just be grounded as a person, I think is, 
is crucial in being present and listening um, with their clients. I think the other piece is that in, in daily life, I don't know if we're all that good at being curious with people. Like, think of the last time you guys went to like some sort of cocktail party or mixer or whatever, and you were talking to someone, how many questions did they ask you about you? I mean, right? Sheena's shaking her head. No, they don't. <laughs> they don't. I mean, if I'll time it. Like, I'll be at some sort of thing where you have to do like the small talk and I'll ask them some questions and I'll, you know, reflect and follow up and whatever. And then like the silence will hit where everyone's kind of awkward. And I'm thinking, hit, hit the ball back, right? <laughs> Bring it back to me. So a concrete way to work on this is if you have someone at home, like if you live with a family member or a partner, it's great and they will love this. Um, make it a goal to ask them two questions a day. Just ask them. Or if they're talking to you about something, make it a goal that in, one, in every conversation you're going to ask one follow-up conversation. So you just practice being curious. I don't think we're actually not curious. I just don't think that we ever practice asking people questions. Great. There, there must be differences in value in terms of questions. Mm -hmm. If you're going to practice this, I, I, and I believe this, that there are high value questions and low value questions. Okay. Can we talk about that? Oh, sure. What it, yeah. how do, okay, so people are going to be, all right, I'm going to be really curious now. I'm going to practice with my family. I'm going to practice with my clients. Give them some guidelines because not all questions are equal, I think. Okay. Um, well, I think you're going to be in, in specific contexts, right? So... I, I think I know what you mean in terms of high value questions, because when I've heard you talk about talking to clients, you're asking them really thoughtful questions like, um, how would this affect your business in a number of years, right? What, you know, you're asking them very thoughtful questions about that. I think I would start actually just very small, because I think so many people don't do this at all, that I wouldn't want them to get jammed up in their daily life about if it's a good question or not. I would just want them to be asking questions about the person in front of you. So you can certainly ask your partner questions like, what did you have for lunch today? And that's fine. Like, that's not a bad question, actually, for a partner. But if, you're, if they're telling you a story about work and you're asking them a question that has some sort of emotional component to it, that, I guess, in my world would be the high value question. So if it's something like, how did that make you feel? Or what was that like when he told you that feedback? Or you know, something that has an emotional connection to it is probably the high value. Mm, okay. I, and I like that. I like, I like your energy. <laughs> you're like, Chris, you're going for this. And you're like, Stern Asian dad, let me just take it back a little bit. Just get started. And th that's probably gonna be really helpful for our, our audience that, at large. Mm -hmm. one, one thing that I would give to somebody, if you're at a party or a function or anywhere, to just spend 10 seconds to try to ask a question that's specific to that person, mm -hmm. whatever you can deduce. Mm -hmm. We all sp send out a lot of energy to people and we can, like the way you dress, the way you stand, maybe mm -hmm. your haircut, mm -hmm. if you have earrings or tattoos, mm -hmm. maybe design a question that's specific, like out of genuine curiosity. Yeah. Versus yeah. like, hey, what's the weather like today? Yeah. Which is, I, I know what a lot of people do. Right. right. Yeah. No, I think that's a good point. Genuine okay. curiosity. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Now, let's circle back. Mm -hmm. Well, before we do that, I just want to welcome my pro community that are sitting here in person and also online. And then they're, they're asking questions, I think, on Slido. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. And so when you guys get a moment and just flag me, let me know that there's a good question. Like, do you guys have a question already on this before we get into some of this value conversation? You do, Ryan? Okay. It, it, Shima, can you help out with the mic? Thank you. So you mentioned something that uh, struck a chord with me in that you said when someone's anxious or nervous, you can feel it. Um, something that I struggle with when I'm talking to someone uh, like a client or my partner even, and they're feeling a strong emotion, I feel it too. Mm -hmm. So how do you have any suggestions of a way to sort of mitigate that sort of mirroring? Because when two people are anxious and they're both talking to each other, it's... It, the conversation doesn't go as smoothly as it could. 
Yeah, that, that's a great question. And I appreciate the vulnerability of that question. Um, See what she just did there? <laughs> I'm going to redo this the whole time now. <laughs> but it is a vulnerable question. And, you know, I anxiety is such a normal thing to feel, especially when you're in a situation where you want to do well. And we want to do well for our partners and we want to do well for clients. So I think the first step is just to acknowledge that it's completely normal and okay to feel anxious. I think oftentimes what our brain does with anxiety is that it immediately tries to block it or change it. And we say, I can't be anxious. Oh God, I can't have this. I can't do this. I can't have that. And I'm someone who gets panic attacks. So that, like, that's the most heightened version of anxiety in the moment. Um, and they're awful and they completely will annihilate your ability to, like it might annihilate my ability to do something. Like I'm in the bathroom if I'm having a panic attack. So the first, the, what the brain is doing with anxiety is that its first instinct is to say, oh no, it can't happen right now, right? And all that's gonna do is jack up your anxiety. So the first thing to practice is counterintuitive, but it's to actually say, it's okay that I'm anxious right now. And for anyone watching who struggles with panic attacks, the mindset would sound like, I can have a panic attack right now. Like if it happens, and I puke my guts out on the floor right now, no one's gonna remember me in a year anyway, right? Who cares? It might take a year. It might take a year, <laughs> but like, it's a year. Right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not forever. So, so I think the first step is to get more used to just validating that it's okay. We all have different systems. Some are more anxious, mine is. Some are less anxious, great good for you that's awesome they have something else they're going to struggle with or deal with i think i think the the second piece so this is where i'll need your all's feedback so what i would say with a partner might not work with a client so this is where i'm not sure with a partner the helpful thing is to actually just name that you're feeling anxious because often when we're talking to partners um and they seem a little frustrated or upset with us, what our mind starts to do is go, oh no, there's some sort of right answer here. There's some sort of way I was supposed to respond that I didn't <coughs> respond. Um, I see this thought process actually more typical in males than females. Um, not that there's a gender binary, but in general. Um, and so the, the step to do is to name the anxiety. Instead of trying to get the right answer, just say, I'm feeling kind of anxious right now. Can we slow down? I don't know if you can do that with a client so much, but if there's some sort of way that you can validate for yourself, like I'm feeling kind of anxious right now, I just need to slow down, that might be helpful. And I think the third is to refocus your mind to what's valuable about you in the moment. What's valuable about you in the moment is your ability to listen to them. And you don't need any special skills to do that. You know how to do that. So remind yourself, like, they're not looking for me to be a genius here. They're looking for me to listen and really understand what's happening for them. And I think Melinda told a good story about this, of, like, you would just listen to a client for, like, 20 minutes, and they were like, awesome, you're great, I want to hire you, <laughs> right? So thank you for the question. Okay, well, now I'm going to do the play-by-play -play breakdown. Okay. Usually I'm in my booth and... I can take notes sure. and then I do the recap at the end of the show. I'm going to do, I, I think, recaps while we're doing this because there's a lot of subtle things maybe that you may not be picking up on that I'm going to share with you, okay? So, Ryan, I'm going to ask you this question first. How did you feel about the way Wesley listened to you? Can, can you give him the mic back? Um, I felt like she was, there. I, I felt like there was, she was listening very intently um, and that she answered in a way that was sort of like very, like the, the, the base level emotion was very calm and peaceful. That's kind of what I got. Thank nice. you. Nice. Oh, good. Did you feel secure in going further with the? Yeah, I yeah. felt very, uh, it felt very safe and like there was no judgment whatsoever. Um, oh, yeah. Thanks, Ryan. I'm so glad. Okay. <laughs> Look at the. <laughs> See, this is relationship, man, right? <laughs> Positive feedback loop happening right face. now. It's like, <laughs> okay, okay. So a couple of things. I immediately noticed the difference between the way you answered that 
versus the way I answered that. I'm like a trained dog and there's a piece of meat on the floor. I'm like, I'm going to go for it right now. And I started going into, here's the answer. Here's what you need to do, blah, 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 and you'll be fine. And go, go be with God. Just do it, right? <laughs> and then you'll be like, he didn't even hear me. <laughs> that rat? Okay, so I'm going to first break down the recap, and then I'll tell you how I would have answered the question before. This is, we're going to call this pre-Wesley, and then there will be post-Wesley, okay? So um, here's what you did. First, you acknowledge and you appreciated the question. Just say, that's a really good question. And then what she did was she normalized that to make you mm -hmm. feel like that's okay. A being anxious is actually quite normal. That's what she said, right? And then she didn't, um, then, then she didn't try to block or change the energy and just was okay with it. The next thing she did was she related it to herself. I too have panic attacks. So calculated, right? I too have <laughs> panic attacks. I was in the bathroom, you know? So she made it very relatable. And then she started to ease into the advice, the prescriptive part, which is, uh, here's how you deal with it. And w then she capped it off with, you don't always have to have the answers. And that kind of eases the pressure of you as the listener to all this. And she focused on why listening is so valuable and powerful by bringing in an anecdote of Melinda doing it. Was it that, sounds like I it? did really good. You did great. <laughs> you did great. You did totally great. Okay. Here's how I would have done it. <laughs> okay. The first thing that I would have said to you is probably from, from Tony Robbins that everything somebody says in a human to human communication point of view is either an expression of love or a cry for help. So if it's not an expression of love, you're anxious, you're anxious, you definitely don't want to respond to that with your own cry for help. Oh, I'm anxious too, and this is great. So it elevates. So then you have to just recognize it right away. And I love how binary that is, and that if it's not great, then, it, then it's, I need help. So be helpful. What does this person need right now? And to switch your mindset. And maybe a lot of times it's just to listen. And the other thing that, Wesley did from Chris Voss's book, Never Split the Difference, is she used a different term, but Chris calls it labeling the emotion. Mm -hmm. And she identified it like, you're anxious. OK, I get it. I feel mm -hmm. it too. It's OK to feel that. It's actually quite normal. Mm -hmm. And then that's going to just ease it. And I, I think the thing that you said about this feeling is that if you block it, it makes it worse. Yeah, for sure. And if you just embrace it, it goes away. Yeah. Don't try to block it. Don't. I mean, if you have to puke, puke, but just don't do it here. Yeah. Think, I think of I think of emotion like a wave, right? It's going to come and it's going to peak and then it's going to abate. But when we block it, we don't ever get to trust that it ends because we just stay in that cyclone of like it's here, it's here, it's not ending. We have to like let it come through and, and then we start to trust that emotions end. Happiness ends. Anxiety ends. So you've not seen me in a fight before, right? Because it's like I a never-ending emotion. Like, oh my God, yeah. it's like a tsunami. It just, yeah. Does the emotions ever stop? But well, yeah. that's, that's going to be where the emotions are going to peak right. the most. Okay, fantastic. Do you guys have a follow-up question or should we get into this value thing? Anything? Okay, we're going to do it then, okay? So one of the most common things is talking about price. Mm -hmm. And there's obviously anxiety about that. There's a lot of anger and resentment and some passive aggressive energy around it. Mm -hmm. And I think there is this kind of desire to please people. So mm -hmm. when somebody's like, can we do it for less? Your instincts are, I'm a people pleaser. Yes, we can do it for less. I don't value my work. Or you go the opposite spectrum, like how dare you, so insulting. Mm -hmm. Usually they don't say it, they mm -hmm. just feel it and passive aggressively walk out the door like whatever, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so how do we use some of the things that you've learned in your mm -hmm. practice and apply it to a situation like that? Well, I, I think I can answer that in, in two different places. So okay. one place is gonna be if the client actually starts pushing back, right? But the first place is how, I think what you're saying is how, how do I help someone who does not appreciate design or the cost of design see some value in that, which is a lot of what you help with. And I have a story about that that I actually think could be helpful. Okay, so this is like maybe six months ago. This is before I knew anything about the future. So if there is an area that does not appreciate design, 
it is therapists. Therapists have the worst websites of all time. They are so ugly. There's like a pile of rocks and a couple in their 60s holding hands. That's every therapist website. The copy on the website is <laughs> atrocious. They are using words that not even therapists understand. Everything about therapy is bad design, okay? <laughs> therapists need you, please help the therapists. <laughs> so, so no therapist wants to spend money on design. Right. And therapists don't honestly make a lot of money. And so, I mean, I, I can actually break down like how therapists make money or not, if it's helpful, but most uh -huh. therapists are maybe clocking in at like sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 a year. Um, if, unless they're like killing it in their field and actually have thought about branding and marketing and actually are niching down. Um, and a lot of therapists are making way less than that. Like if, if they're seeing clients, um, you know, from, more from like insurance panels or whatever, it's gonna be a tangent, but okay. So I was in this camp. I, I actually did appreciate design, um, but I didn't understand the design world. I didn't understand how you guys worked at all. So a friend of mine calls me up and she said, hey, I'm thinking about this business project. Would you be interested? And I was on the fence. I wasn't sure. It would take a lot of time. And I was waffling and Part of a main part of the business would be based out of this website. So she said, just talk to this web guy that I know. And I was like, oh brother, like I don't want to do this phone call. Like I like, I'm not even sure if I want to do this thing. Like, what is this guy gonna really say? So I was kind of the worst kind of client because I knew a little bit about design. So we're the uh -oh. we're the worst, right? So when you know enough to think that you know a lot, but you don't know anything. That was me six months ago. So I had, cause I had, I had built my own website out of, on Squarespace, right? And I have a relatively all right aesthetic. Like I could figure out how to make it look okay. And I liked building it. So I built out some for my friends. So by the time I had this phone call, I had, I had built like six websites in Squarespace. So I was like a website, like, you know, that's not hard to do. I'm just gonna build a website, mm -mm -mm. who cares? <laughs> so so I, 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 was, I was the client that everyone fears to talk to. So I wasn't even a cold call. I was like a frosty call because I did not want to do this call. So I'm like on the call and I'm like, what's this guy gonna say that's like, you know, mm -mm -mm. And then my friend tells me he thinks it might be around $3,000. And I was like, $3,000 for something that I can build for $150. I was like, who does this person think he is? Like, this is insane. Within, <laughs> within 15 minutes of this phone call, my mind genuinely went from, I would not pay this joker $300 to I would pay him $10,000. Like that's, that's the way my mind flipped in 15 minutes. And what he did was he just asked me really thoughtful questions about what we wanted to achieve, which is everything that you, you guys have to listen to Chris. He knows what he's talking about. There's only one person who needs to listen to me. It's my wife, but I'm working on that. It's a 60 year project, it's a 60 year project. Family's the hardest. I'm getting a little closer every day. So he asked me questions not from an arrogant way, not from like a, I know so much better than you kind of way. He just asked me questions like, what would you want this to achieve? And how, he really was asking me user experience questions, which I didn't know even that term at the time. And I thought, oh, oh, what design will do is save me from making a million stupid expensive mistakes. That's what design will do. It's not even so much about how it looks, it's about it's going to help me with the business part of this. This person's going to help me think. And that's, that's the piece that I realized was so valuable. So I think, you know, just like if I, if you guys were to take one thing from that story, I would want you to know that what I need and what so many people need is how you think about it. Um, Cause you're thinking about the business part and the design part in a way that other people can't. Like, I can't, I don't know everything that you guys know. I don't know a 10th of what you guys know, but I don't know that I know I need that, right? <laughs> so I'm not gonna look like I need it. I'm gonna look kind of frosty. So does that, is that a good answer to the first part of that? 
Yeah, I think so. That was a great story. <laughs> okay. You went from being the client from hell to being the best kind of client. Yeah. So I'm curious in this story, what was the bill for it? So the, what, what he proposed was $5,000. I didn't end up doing it not because of the price, but because I didn't want to invest in that project. But I would definitely call him back and spend more money on something I want to do mm -hmm. down the road. Okay, so relative to the new perception of value, you mm -hmm. went from $300 mm -hmm. to $10,000. Mm -hmm. So in the diagnostic phase, this person asking you these questions and making you aware of things you didn't know, mm -hmm what you don't know. And then that created this sense of trust and maybe like you're in over your head. Mm, yeah. Right. That's, that's exactly what it did. And so I was like, Oh, I don't know anything about what I'm right. thinking about. So then you felt more inclined to say, this is really valuable. I, I don't want to waste a lot of time, energy and money mm -hmm. in small places. Mm -hmm. I could do this. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's great. Yeah. Okay. So, so the deal did not come to fruition, but that's really how you do it. Yeah, and I, okay. and I would definitely call this designer again. Okay, so can we get a little bit more tactical? So if somebody mm -hmm. says to, maybe in a more hostile, like, mm -hmm. I know you think you're frosty, <laughs> but our audience sees much, much harsher people, because you're still yeah. a kind person at your core. Sure. Where some of these business people are quite ruthless. Mm -hmm. They're looking to get as much as possible for as little as possible. Mm -hmm. And they're going to exploit market forces and insecurity, mm. all those kinds of things. Mm. So they're Man, coming it's a in. cold world out there. It is there. a cold world. And I'm trying to teach you how to deal with that cold <laughs> world. But okay. So a client gets on the phone, mm -hmm. says, look, can you do this for $500? And let's just say that's a tenth of what you think you need to get. How do you begin to navigate from $500 to 5000 Well, I mean, to, to me, I think... I would say, no, <laughs> I cannot do that because I know what, I mean, at least, you know, and as a therapist, like I know what I, what it costs to produce what I produce for someone. Right. And so I have two options. I'm going to do something in a way that's healthy and beneficial, or I'm going to do something in a way where I start to feel resentful. And if I feel resentful, I cannot do good work. And so I can't choose that option. Okay. Am I making it too simple? No, I, I like that. But you just struck at the problem, which is a lot of people take work and they're resentful about doing the work. Yeah. And they're going to fire back to say, I, I need to, I need to pay the rent. I need to buy yeah. food today. And that's not a luxury I have. Right. So I, let's, can we just do something crazy? Yeah. Can we just, sure. instead of talking about it theoretically, can we just enter into role play mode? Sure. Okay. Yeah. You guys will see how she does this, right? Right. But right. Keep in mind, like, I'm not going to know the design It's okay. Okay. It's okay. I'm, uh, ho hopefully we're going to make a point. Who knows? This is live. <laughs> it's dangerous. Anything can happen. And this is why people tune in. Sure. Okay. So I'll be the client. Okay. I'm going to be a jerk. <laughs> I'm going to try real hard. I'm going to just act, okay? Because really, in real life, I'm not like this at all. I'm going to try it out. I'm, I'm trying to get an Academy Award here, okay? So, Wesley, I saw your website. And, and yeah, I think the work is good. But... We, we need to do this thing for 500 bucks. Can you design our website for 500? No, I'm so sorry. I can't. How come? Isn't it really simple? Like, I built a website myself before and I've done it. It only takes a few hours. Well, I mean, first we would probably need to understand what you need the website for. Can I ask you some questions about what you're trying to accomplish with it? Sure. Yeah. I'm a therapist and, you know, I need to communicate my message out there and it seems like we just use rocks and people holding hands and I want to do something <laughs> a little different. What, what are you hoping, if the website is kind of what you envision it to be, what are you, what are you hoping it would change or accomplish? Uh, I want to have more people ultimately reach out to maybe book an appointment or something. Okay, so, so what you're trying to achieve with the website is getting clients in. Yes. Okay. And so for you, what, where would that take your business? So from where it is today to where you would want it to be in terms of profit, what are you hoping, where are you hoping it would land for you? I don't know if you know this, but therapists just don't make a lot of money. I do know this. Right. So <laughs> I would like to see maybe a 10 or $20,000 increase in my, my annual billing. Mm -hmm. Right now it's about 60 K. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Okay, so what you want to do is to have a website that is really clear. It's really speaking to the clients you want to get in. 
and that they're going to look at this website and they're going to say, this is the therapist for me. I'm going to, I'm basically, I'm going to convert. I'm going to go from looking at this to coming in. You got it. Yeah. And it sounds like you have some pretty big goals. That's a pretty, that's a pretty big goal of what you want to achieve, which is great for me to do my best work. I know that it costs $3,000 to make a website like that. That's my best work for you. That's what I can do for you. I totally get if you can't afford that. That's fine. If you can't afford it, there are other designers who might help you. Um, You can build your own. If you build your own, you're paying with time. So with me, you're paying with money. And with building your own, you're paying with time. But that's totally up to you. What's the difference between you and somebody else that I see on Fiverr or 99designs that could do this for $300? Like, we're talking about a 10x increase here. Mm Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's a good question. You want to know kind of what what value am I bringing? What's the value of having a designer, right? That's the question you're asking versus just someone who's going to kind of make something look the way you tell them to make it look. Is that the difference? I think it might be. I mean, if if you're hiring someone off of Fiverr, which is totally fine, you're going to tell them what you want them to make. Didn't right. I just tell you what I want you to make? Well, my, my hope and where I think the best work comes from is when I and a client are collaborating to create a vision for them. So we're taking what you think and we're taking what I think and we're making something completely unique that can't be made otherwise. So that's the thing that you're paying for is how I think about it, which is based on you know school and experience and all the ways that we develop how we think. Um, and that's the value that I offer. Mm. I like your energy. You seem really grounded. You make a compelling case. I tell you what, I'm willing to split the difference. I think my initial offer was like 500 and you said 3000. So why don't we go 1500? Well, I, I hear that you're seeing some value in what I'm saying, which is great. Um, my price is not negotiable, unfortunately. So not why, negotiable. Don't you, why don't you take everything's some, <laughs> negotiable? <laughs> why don't you take some time to think about it? Because I don't want to pressure you. I want this to be something that you feel totally good about coming in with. Totally good about coming in with. No pressure. It's, I just went three X. And I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, if you do a good job for me, other therapists are going to see the difference that there's a different way to do things besides rocks and holding hands. I, I can recommend you and refer you to other people. You can get yeah. a lot more work if you do this. Don't be foolish here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I really hear, I really hear how you think it could benefit me. And I appreciate that you're trying to think through ways it might benefit me. Um, I know for me what it costs to do this level of work. And so that's, that's where I am with it. So what are you saying? I think I'm, I think I'm saying that this is what I can provide for you. We can talk more about what you're looking for. If you want to feel more comfortable about me understanding your issue, if we if you want to understand more about exactly, you know, how it might look or things that I've done before, we can definitely spend time talking about that. But at this point, you know what the price is. So you should take the time that you need to think about if that's the right price for you. Okay, it doesn't sound like we're coming to any kind of agreement here. Is that what you're saying? You're gonna say no to this? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. All right. Yeah. All right, I appreciate it, thanks so much. You're so welcome. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. I already hung up on you before you said you're welcome, by the way. (laughs) I'm like, yo. All right, let's talk about this. I, I think I've tried my best to channel every person who watches our channel every objection whether you're from south africa nigeria part of the far east whatever they're going to say these things Mm -hmm. how do you guys feel about this i yeah i don't know because i'm not a designer (laughs) i don't know if i answered it isn't it a horrible world let me just tell you (laughs) what we have to do i know i feel so bad for you all (laughs) okay jesse what's your question Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We can't hear you, Jesse. So that's okay. You just stay there. So basically, she said, you seem like you speak like a designer. Because oh, you talked about the desired future state. Mm-hmm. And you talked about collaboration. Mm-hmm. And you, you, you're a great listener. And you're trying to kind of identify goals and things like that. So 
You're doing great. All right. That's what my wife is saying. <laughs> You're doing great. Okay. Anybody else? Any thoughts? Like, Melinda, since you know me so well, I'm going to put you on the hot seat. Yeah, I know. You can't just sit there and just hide the whole time, right? Try to sit in the back so the teacher... The question I have for you, Melinda... Yeah, you try to... There's only one spot that's farther away, which is where Ryan's sitting, but okay. The question for you is, can you be really analytical? Put your analytical hat on and compare and contrast how Wesley was doing that versus how you've seen me coach people do it. I'm curious. Are there differences between our styles? Um, the energy is different. Let's talk about it. <laughs> what do you mean? Wesley did have what you had mentioned, the grounded energy. She was grounded, and you could tell she knew who she was. She knew what she offered. She knew what she wouldn't accept, and she didn't budge. And, but it was the energy behind it. I know you've taught that same thing, but there's a different energy with how Wesley presented it than I normally see. That's how I see myself. You. What are you talking about? What do you mean different energy? The, the grounded, the slower. So you're saying I'm not slower. grounded? The sl slow? So she's slower? She slowed down the she conversation. Slowed down, yes. The, um, I sometimes sense a more aggressive or driven nature about you. Yeah. Where she was more sat. It's, I, if I was on the phone with her, I would imagine her just sitting back and being very comfortable with herself. Whereas I, I would imagine you. Paint the picture not, for us. Not clenching your fun. fist, but you know, maybe a, a vein bulging or uh, <laughs> what did this you one say? right here. A vein. It, it just <laughs> twitches like <laughs> you more moron, tense. you freaking client. More tense. <clears throat> um, yeah, there's yeah. A, a slight bit more aggression though in you that I sent. Like four more, four percent more. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Well, and I think, you know, you had made a good point earlier, Chris, which is, you know, sometimes you have to take low paying jobs, right? Yes. And as a therapist, like there were a number of years where I had to see people for $50 a session, no dollars a session because I had to get licensing hours yeah. and I was desperate. Um, I think that's part of development. Like I didn't come out of grad school charging what I charge now for a session. I mean, part of development is that I had to go through learning and feeling confident about what I do offer and making sure that like I do actually have something to offer. Um, and then I started to be able to charge more because I felt confident in what I'm delivering. Also, I spend an enormous amount of money in training and supervision. So I know not every therapist is doing that. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. What other topics should we tackle? Either for you guys that are here live or the people our pro community or is anybody monitoring youtube in case youtube has a great question yeah let's acknowledge those people how many people are watching live on youtube right now 434 guys welcome back to the live stream you 434 people okay so what, what's a good question who's asking it Dave Coe asked. oh dave co excellent oh, we need to pass the mic to him yeah my my own av team is forgetting yeah there you go all right uh dave co asked when asking questions go ahead when I'm asking questions, how many is too many questions? I feel like I'm interrogating them. That's an excellent question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. David Coe. That is a really good question, David. Mm -hmm. Are, yeah. Is yeah. there such a thing as too many questions? Yeah, I think that is a good question. And it, to me, it speaks. I already said that, by the way. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. I'm learning. David Coe does not need two people to validate him. <laughs> he only needs Chris to validate him. <laughs> One is enough. So, One is plenty. One is fine. <laughs> um, so I think this is where if your goal is to really understand what someone is experiencing or where they're coming from, that helps with the pacing. So if you, f if you find yourself interrogation mode or someone is in interrogation mode, I see it as that they're not actually letting themselves absorb what they're hearing. If they're like, boom, 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 they're not really taking it in and digesting it. I, Matthew, you're nodding. You are, the, you are the master of taking in what someone says, actually. I think Matthew's off the charts in, in thoughtfulness of like how he absorbs a message. So watch Matthew's videos, that will help. Um, but, but yeah, so I think making sure that you're absorbing the message and taking a minute with it, and then even try to reflect back before you ask the next question. Not in like a, 
you know, stiff way of like, what I hear you saying is blah, blah, blah. But, oh, okay, this is what I'm hearing. This is how I'm taking this in. Okay. David Coe, it's, it's my experience that if you are genuinely interested in what the other person has to say, I don't know if there's ever such a thing as asking too many questions. Mm -hmm. Right? Right? I mean, let's just, let's just understand something. I, I think we all could use a little bit more love mm -hmm. and, and love is uh, understanding and appreciation. Mm -hmm. So when your sole attention is on me, mm -hmm. I feel love. Mm -hmm. I feel like you appreciate me and I feel like you're trying your best to understand me. Mm -hmm. I think where the whole interrogation thing comes, it's because of tone mm -hmm. and you have an agenda. Mm -hmm. And that's if you can, a, yeah, if you point. can manage tone and agenda, mm -hmm. so let's tackle those first. Let's not try to have an agenda. The agenda is you wanting something from this conversation. And if you ask the questions to steer towards that, any reasonably intelligent person can see like, you're not listening to me. The only kinds of questions that you're asking are directing me towards what you want. Mm -hmm. So you're going to get the opposite effect. Yeah. So let's remove the agenda. You said, I don't have an agenda and I try to check my agenda at the door. Mm -hmm. Okay, and my sole focus is on that person. Number two is the tone. The tone really impacts the message. There's some kind of rule, it's like 33% or something like that, right? Where that changes how somebody feels about you. Now I noticed with Wesley, she's very good at managing her tone and her eyebrows and her smile, right? She's very good at that, I'm, I'm paying attention here, okay? And so it's almost like she can say, you're dumb and you're worthless, and you're like, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Right? You can say that where I, I say to my tone, you know, you mother effer. How dare you say that about me? Right? It's tone. Tone. So let's practice our tone. And in Chris Voss, he talks about the three tones. Tone number one is really assertive. That's what Melinda would call my normal energy. Assertive. Right? Number two is to use the speaking smile. When whatever you say, just smile because it changes the way you think about what you say. And you can say horrible things and still smile and it'll be all right. So just try and smile, try to be happy. It, it's actually a, like a, a psychological advantage when you smile, it really is. You're, you're like tricking your body and your mind into being positive. The last one is the late night FM DJ voice, which is you slow down. You, sleep, you speak in slow, deliberate terms mm -hmm. and you just, you, you channel the Wesley. That's what she's been doing. So slow, so gentle. I, those are all amazing points. Yeah. Matthew has something. Yeah, I think there's one layer deeper to Dave's question because I've had lots of conversations with him and I can see this reoccurring. So what we teach people is ask good questions so that we can arrive at a conclusion together. And people are just trying to get the checkbox. Oh, I need to understand scope, checkbox. Mm, I need to understand what needs to look like checkbox, right? So they're, they're listening for those things. I think where some people, and Dave can correct me if I'm wrong, some people have a hard time identifying when we have arrived to a conclusion because mm. they'll keep asking and they'll keep asking mm. and they'll keep asking and they're so focused on asking the question now instead of, you know, like they're trying to get forward. So are there ways that we could recognize that both you and I, like the client and myself, have arrived at the conclusion? Yeah, that's a really... Smart way to put that, um, because what you're hitting on is something that therapists have to think about, right? So a therapist asks a million questions, hopefully, they're asking a lot of questions, um, to understand someone, or reflecting, but it's all getting to the same point. The way I know when I've hit on something is because I have the conceptualization of what, of what people suffer through. So I know that I'm listening for specific words or specific themes. And when I hear those, that's where I'm latching on and I'm expanding and I'm focusing in. So as designers, you, you know, I'm sure, or I keep saying designers, I should say creatives probably, but because uh, part of this would be brand strategy questions, that you have a framework of what you're trying to listen for, I would guess, right? That help you inform your work. And I think this just takes time and development. Like therapists, I will work my whole life to get better at the conceptualization of the, how do people work? What, where do they get stuck? What's gonna help them move? I'll spend the rest of my life getting better at that. So I think it's a developmental process, but 
you're you're listening for those things and when you hear them it's like a little ding like a little light goes and then that's the thing you grab and then that's where you stay does that answer it well so it sounds like you need the development practice mm -hmm. to start seeing the patterns yes otherwise you're just asking and you're not looking for anything or you don't know what to look for actually yeah and pattern is the perfect way to say that you need the development and the experience to de to know what's the pattern what's the pattern i'm looking for here i'd like to jump in matthew that was a really smart way to phrase that <laughs> the way <laughs> no I, I just want to share something with you guys that to think is a difficult thing in, in the book Socratic Selling, they talk about this. When you're talking to somebody, there's a complex process that's going in here and the client doesn't arrive having thoughts fully formed or even knowing what problem they wanna to talk to you about. So when you ask them questions, you're helping them to think. And that's really all you're doing because to, to make a decision, it's scary because mm -hmm. it means I have to commit to something, I could be wrong, mm -hmm. the future is uncertain, and we all are trying not to make mistakes. So many people that come and ask for help they always come back with this question. It's like, my, if I can ban this question forever, I would. And that's the, what if? What if my client doesn't do this? What if they don't agree? I mean, what if is a good question, if you think in the positive, but almost always, what if? What if it doesn't work out? Mm -hmm. What if they yell at me? What if they, they just go there and I ask them, have you tried? So you understand that to make a decision is really difficult. And my wife pointed out to me that the root word of decide is side, which is like to kill. Mm -hmm. So when you say, in a very simple sense, like, what do you want to eat today? I have to make a decision. And for my wife, it's a very difficult decision. It's like this kind of food or that kind of food, because I want to eat both, but I can't. Sure. Yeah. My stomach is only so big. Do I want Mexican? Do I want Chinese? Do I want Japanese? So we're killing off our options. And so you need to realize this, that it's hard to make a decision. And if you embrace that and you ask the questions to the client to help them come to a place where they have clarity, on what the pros and cons are for one decision versus the other, mm -hmm. you've done a good thing for them. So I'm trying in my mind to help them come to a place where at the end of all this, it's one decision. And then to help them think through option A and option B. Mm -hmm. And then they get to decide. And that's pretty much the end of the conversation at that point. Mm -hmm. Can I add something onto that? Yes, please. Because I, I think that in that decision, right, is also their dilemma, right? So if I spend money on this foolishly, something bad will happen, right? I could get fired or I would lose all that money or whatever it is. So if I, I, I this is a guess because this is where I'm hoping my world crosses your world, um, but I would guess that if someone could feel like you appreciate their dilemma, like if you appreciate that this will cost them money, if you appreciate that there could be a consequence if it doesn't go well, they're gonna trust that you're holding them and you're caring about them, right? That they're like, okay, you care about the fact that I could lose this. You're gonna, that what their brain is telling them is you're gonna do a good job because you care about it. Yes, excellent. Okay, that was great. Oh, good. Yes, should we take on another question? Sure. Here you go. So this comes from Maria, she said, if a client makes an offensive comment, like being sexist, if she's a woman, um, mm -hmm. what might you do to go forward and still continue on the conversation in a positive manner? Ooh. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Okay. Please. Okay. So I'm going to divide conflict. I think I'm going to name it as conflict, um, but that's a pretty broad term. I'm going to divide conflict into two columns. In one column, there's, I don't want to work with this client again kind of conflict, right? I think uh, in a recent video you guys did, Ben was talking about a really rough situation with a client who had like screamed at him and cussed him out on the phone. Like that's in this column of like, this is conflict where like, this is not healthy for you. You don't need to be spending your time like this. So with the sexist comments, like part of me thinks like, are you nearing that column where this is just not a healthy person for you to work with? And then the solution to that is that, I mean, we can get more granular, but in your head, you're knowing like, this is not healthy for me if we can't navigate this conflict. And the other column is conflict that is very, very 
able to be navigated. So um, they don't like something that you've done. They're they're upset about the time it's taking. They wish that your process was different or that you had incorporated them more into your process. That's conflict that you absolutely can work with. So with the sexist comment, I think part of it is you know, making that decision for yourself. Like how, how much am I gonna go into this with this client? Like, is this something where I want to address this, right? So if you want to address it, it's as difficult and as simple as saying, wow, that didn't feel so good to me. Can we talk about that? That's a risk with a client, right? That client may not be looking for you to build a relationship with them. They just might be looking for them to be able to be whoever they want to be and for you to be their order taker and do whatever they tell you to do. So that is that is a tough one, I think. If it's me and a client says a sexist comment, it's awesome because my world is, we're going to process this <laughs> and we're going to talk about why you made that comment. And we're going to talk about how that made both of us feel. And then we're going to talk about how talking about it makes you feel. <laughs> so we're going to stay there all day. So in my world, it's fantastic because we're using that. But in your world, you might, in, you know, you have different goals than I do. Great. Let's take another question. Shima, do you, you want to say something, Shima? Yeah. Um, I love that you took on this uh, sexism question and that I wasn't the one to bring it up because I really did want to bring it up, but Ooh. I felt bad um, because so many times in my work, it's my male friends that tell me that's really sexist. So I'm like, no, it's not. They're like, yeah, it really is. And like, I don't even recognize it mm. because I don't even, I don't consider myself to be like feminine or masculine. Like I'm just doing my thing, mm -hmm. right? I, I'm not, I'm not looking for these things, but as someone that's dealt with it many, many times, mm -hmm. um, I would feel super uncomfortable in saying like, oh, that made me feel weird. Can we talk about this and process this? Mm -hmm. Like that would, and I'm not scared of like saying things mm -hmm. like, you know, Do like not. I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a lot like Chris in like the, the way that we uh, kind, com communicate. Gentle, kind, loving, kind, yes. gentle, not yeah. assertive at all. No. Mm -hmm. um, I've had a phone call where a client was being sexist with me and mm -hmm. uh, the client didn't know that I had my business affairs guy in the car with me like listening in and my business affairs guy is like mm -hmm. WTF mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and he just looks at me and he just goes like he, he's like don't you know don't respond to that like mm -hmm. don't even acknowledge that mm -hmm. so with me like I I take the I'm trying to take the higher road and like not acknowledging I'm just not going to acknowledge that you just, you know, mm -hmm. lower yourself to that level. But then at the end of a call, I can feel good about, well, I didn't lower myself to that level. Mm -hmm. But I also am not really feeling good that, like, I didn't let them know that, like, that's not cool. Mm -hmm. That's not the way we engage. That's not the way I do business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as I sort of feel like it's like, I always feel like it's my job to teach people. Sure. Because, you know, so many of us here are teachers and like mm -hmm. we feel like we need to constantly be teaching people. Mm -hmm. But then when it's a client relationship mm -hmm. and they're the ones holding the proverbial check, mm -hmm. then I have to shut my mouth and mm -hmm. I don't feel good about that. And then that makes me think like, well, maybe I'm in the wrong line of work if I'm relying on these people. So, you know, you're the way that the way you're saying, like, you know, acknowledge it and bring it up. And I wish I could do that as, yeah. as a woman. I really want to do that. Um, but I also, like, really don't want to play the game on that level. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So it's like, how do, you, how do you leave that sort of conversation and feel good about it? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and I think that's, there's a couple <clears throat> things happening with what you're describing. In the moment, if someone says something sexist or racist or whatever it is, what happens in our brains is this sort of like mini shock, right? We're sort of like, what's happening right now that someone would say this, which definitely makes it harder to respond because your system is kind of going into that little freeze moment. Does that make sense? I think in general, it is really hard because if they're holding the check and you feel like, okay, you know, there are times where I'm going to choose to be quiet and I, I feel good that I'm not sinking to, you know, whatever the, the level is that you're saying. 
that that's definitely a choice I've made before, before I was a therapist. It's a choice that, you know, people have to make. And I appreciate that. I think in, and this is sort of maybe a little bit idealistic, what I'm about to say. Um, I think if you're building a relationship with a client, your brain will be deciding, is this someone who I think is worthy of building a relationship with? A lot of what you guys have to think about is, do they like me because they're gonna pay me or hire me? But the more successful you get, you're gonna be thinking, do I like them? Do I wanna work with them? And if it's someone you feel like has relative conversational skill or relative you know, kindness in who they are, it might be worth taking the risk to build a healthier relationship with them, right? One where you get to be seen, right? Yeah, awesome. The dream is we're in relationships and where we're seen, <laughs> even though you're providing something because who you are and what you're bringing is so incredibly valuable. You wanna feel seen in that too. And unfortunately, in, in, the, in the starting out period, we don't always get those relationships and we don't always get the luxury of choosing them. But the more successful we get, the more choice we have. I hope that we are able to, to choose the relationships that are healthy or take the risks to make that relationship healthier and see if, like, is this gonna level up or is this not, and then I disconnect from this relationship. I love that, thank you. Oh, good, thank you. Yeah. I, I wanna acknowledge something here that there is an unbalanced relationship that's happening here because the people who hold the purse strings continue to act in a certain way. And if you're man, woman, black, white, Asian, gay, straight, whatever, it's like they're a barrier between you and your professional success. Mm. And that's the dilemma that we're dealing with because if you say something and they feel really uncomfortable, they're like, okay, cool, thanks for bringing it up, Shima. They get off the phone, like never cross that whole company off your list, never call them ever again. Mm -hmm. And this is an unfortunate reality of mm -hmm. the world. Mm -hmm. it, it is very problematic. And we've seen this so much in the news about how these things are br being brought to our attention now. Mm -hmm. Harvey Weinstein, things like that. Yeah. Right. And it's like, I, I know what you're talking about, Shima. It's, I don't know if there's a great answer to that. Mm -hmm. But I do understand it. Um, the, the only little thing I can, the little solace, the little kernel here, sunshine that I can put on this is this, is that the only leverage you have as a creative human being is to withhold your services to somebody. It's not great, but I'm just saying that's the only thing I can say is that if we all, all of us collectively identify that that person, that company, it, especially if it's institutional, that this is the way they treat people is to starve them of talent. And if enough of us did this, mm -hmm. if we acted on our conviction, I think you would be able to eventually bankrupt them. Mm -hmm. Because that kind of behavior should not be supported, tolerated at all. And this is why the conversations like this on the future are so important. Like, that's it. Because more people need to know that they do have a voice and we do bring something to the table. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Reggie. <laughs> Microphone? Yeah, thank you. So Norma asked, what are books or resources that creatives can take in for better communication? Like the ones <gasps> you were. <laughs> I love this question so much. I love this. Thank you for this wonderful question. Because one of my one of my pet peeves as a couples therapist is that I see people reading so many books about business and finance and all this stuff and no one's reading any books about <laughs> relationship um but there are some really great books um so uh the the one i would most recommend is called the the title is a little bit cheesy so just tolerate it it's called hold me tight oh. it's it's written it, yep it's written by dr sue johnson um i think that's the very best book you could read about relationship and communication the, se the second book um, would be, and this is gonna sound funny because they're marriage books, but the second book is um, Seven Principles of Making Marriage Work by John Gottman. And why those are so good is that they really break down uh, communication and relationship, and they also break down what I think of as the if-then 
quotient of communication. So if you say this, then this will happen, right? And it's not 100% of the time, but Gottman would tell you it's 96% of the time. So those are the two books I would recommend. And then in general, I think communication is also about increasing empathy. So uh, on my website, I have a section where I have all the books that I love. And they're really just understanding how people work. And the more you understand how people work, hopefully the more you empathize with them and that, that improves communication as well. I want to send you some love. Okay. I do. I'm, I'm watching the YouTube comments here. People are like, are you serious? Are you going to use social media right now? No, I'm actually watching your comments and I want to say that people are loving it. Oh, good. And, and David Coe, who asked this question before, he's like, this is so good. Oh, thank so you, good. David. And let's see who else there. There's a bunch of, I love how Westland Little's Instagram is so simple, clean, and minimalist. What is your Instagram, by the way? My Instagram is like just okay, but it's Wesley Ann Little. Don't get your Wesley hopes up too high. Wesley Ann Little. <laughs> yeah. You guys can check out our Instagram. <laughs> yes, we'll link it below. Thank you very much. I have another question mm -hmm. based on that question. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I forgot who asked it. The, the previous question, not about the books, Norma, but the previous question about sexism, racism, whatever ism mm -hmm. that they're having. Okay, so we just gave advice like you can walk away. But what if it's your in-house, mm. your staff, right? <laughs> oof, we just heard oof. Now we cannot just so easily walk away. And I know that there there's a big portion of our audience that works in-house. Mm -hmm. And if it's part of like the good old network, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do you respond because your livelihood is in their hands? Yeah, I mean, I think I think you said it well, which is I don't think this is a question with an answer necessarily or like an easy answer. I think if if someone feels like they can take the risk and I have complete understanding if they can't, right? Because it is a risk and it's very hard to take that risk. But if you feel like you can take the risk to talk to someone, then the way I would approach it is really making sure you know what your goal is going into that conversation. So I'm not such a fiery person, right? Like I need some of Sheena energy because I'm not so, I'm not like great at that. So I default to, you know, more of, okay, like I'm going in with the desire for this to be a positive communication where someone understands what I'm saying if you do default to more of that kind of the fiery, like the fighter, um, that's great. And that will be an amazing advocate for yourself. Just know that going into that conversation, you might have to know, like, is my goal for them just to know that I'm upset or is my goal for an increase of understanding? Because you're gonna have to bring different methods with each. If you just want them to know you're upset, great, bring the fire. If your goal is for a possible increase of understanding, you know, going into it with the idea of, and I hope you would only have this conversation with people who you genuinely feel like would, would you know, give a crap that you're talking to them, right? I mean, if you genuinely felt like this wouldn't go well, I don't think anyone would try anyway. But going in and saying, hey, I'd like to have a tough conversation, so you're setting it up right away. I'm feeling pretty anxious about having this conversation. So you're letting them know that you're coming from a place that's hard for you. What happened the other day, while you may not have meant anything bad by it, you're giving them the benefit of the doubt, actually did hurt my feelings or hit my ears in a funny way. This affected me for this reason. Is that something that you're open to hearing or open to talking about with me? If you do it like that, you've done everything. If they, don't, if they don't respond well, that's on them. You've done everything you can. That's it. You got it. That was excellent. Woo, that was good. My wife's like, yeah, I guess she's a therapist. All right, she passes the test. <laughs> she's pretty good. Okay, so you began by saying, kind of um, framing it. Mm -hmm. Like we need to have, I'd like to have a tough conversation with you. Mm -hmm. And then you, voice you label your feeling i'm feeling anxious about this and then you say i'm not sure if you meant this but so you're giving me the benefit of the doubt then this is how it it, it affected me mm -hmm. and are you 
open to hearing this and possibly working towards a solution. Mm -hmm. So all the power is on them. Yeah. And that was beautifully done. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I mean, it's, it's hard to do because I think there's the part of us that wants to come in and say, it's just so not right that they did this thing. Yeah. And that's a real part of this too. I mean, even in that answer, I'm worried that I'm making it sound like it's okay that they said something, you know? So that's where I don't know if there's a good response because I don't know how much we're dealing with someone's fragility that doesn't, that shouldn't be fragile, you know? Yeah. So that's the one I got, but. These are classic setups for movie plot lines, by the way. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like where there's an oppressive boss and the person approaches it exactly like what you're talking about. Like, no, no, no problem, Wesley. And then they move you to department C. Right. And then you're in Siberia and you're like, what happened? And then, and then you take the future courses and you realize I can actually make myself so powerful that I don't need these yahoos. That's and right. then I'm going to take all their clients and don't right. have to deal with any of that crap. I'm going to take this moment to say links to courses and coaching down below. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's take another question. I think we're going to wrap up pretty soon here. I think we have another 10 minutes and then we're going to wrap up. People are just giving us praise right now. There's Why don't you not... read some of the praise? Because I can't read it. All right. This is the best stream of the year. I love this. Best therapy. stream of the year? Yeah. Holy cow. So, I'm personally insulted. So Nick, Nick said it was the best stream <laughs> of the year. <laughs> best. It's really good. See, I told you. <laughs> Therapists and philosophers. Yep. Um, love this therapy session. Oh. Dave Co said it's fire. So yeah, it's just a lot of positivity. A lot of positivity. Oh, I thought you guys were monitoring Slido. Yeah, we're before. doing both. Yeah. Um, Nothing? Nope. Okay, it's cool. The pro group's a little quiet today. Well, we were taking some from there earlier, oh, so see. we already answered We got some. it. Yep. Excellent. Thank you for doing that. Anybody else from the live, live, the people who actually drove and de dealt with LA traffic, which is horrendous? So I had uh, like an observation, comment, question type of thing. Sure. Is first of all, you did a phenomenal job with that that client roller plane. I've seen people that's been in this industry for ten plus years, and they have complete self interest. Mm -hmm. And you remove the self interest and use empathy at the core to really put yourself in the client's space. So if you want to be a designer, you would, you would kill it for a career. <laughs> I'll tell that's my husband say. a we career kind of, change could happen. <laughs> we kind of had like a side conversation, and you know one thing about this industry of business people, as Chris was kind of saying, is they're like the spit and chew designers out. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of it, you know, designers are quirky people where mm. you kind of feel guilty creating art and paying for it. So there's this self, you know, imposter syndrome and all that kind of stuff. I'm pushing that to the side. Mm. One thing that kind of resonated with me when we talked on the side is there's a direct correlation between relationships and self-worth. Mm -hmm. Isn't that conversation? You really understood your capabilities, what you can offer to the table, and there's very strength in that. So if you mm -hmm. don't have any self-worth, um, it's really hard to have a healthy relationship or have a really good conversation with a business person that can just sniff that out. This person has no self-worth and I'm gonna beat you up. Oh. And a lot of designers go running and crying in the bedrooms, right? So how do you, what are some tools and frameworks, I guess, that you use to understand what your, what is your self-worth, right? Yeah, man, coming with the big guns with that uh, one. I know, self-worth is such a massive concept. Um, Let's end it on a light one. <laughs> I think that self-worth is a lifelong process. If you were lucky enough to be in a family where your parents or primary caregivers gave you a lot of positive reflection of who you are, then you might just have kind of medium level insecurities or you know, the insecurities about your expertise level, which is normal, right? That, you know, we all are going to feel insecure until we feel more competent at what we do. I think that if you weren't raised in a household like that, or you were raised with parents who struggled to just validate emotions in general, so they had a hard time validating that it was normal to feel angry or normal to feel sad, what happens is we internalize that there's something wrong with us. We internalize this sense of um, like it because a child really can't see their parent as bad, right? A child has to see their parent as good and capable because a child will die without parents. So what happens is we internalize like, oh, it must be me, right? Like it must be that I'm problematic and that's why, you know, my dad's drinking too much or my mom isn't picking me up from school or, you know, they're not able to talk with me or validate what I'm feeling. And even as I say this, like most of my clients come in 
and they say, you know, my childhood wasn't so bad. My parents did the best they could. And that's fine. Like, that's a, that's a fine framework. But I'm sitting there going, mm-mm, mm-mm. Like, you, you, you had a much tougher childhood than you realize. So I don't think that we always even validate that maybe growing up, even if our parents did do the best they could, they didn't give us some crucial components that help us feel worthy and help us feel like we matter and we belong. So the big picture work of self-worth, which in my bias is probably needs a therapist to help with because I think that's the, one of the beautiful things about therapy is that it helps us with self-worth. Um, but I think it's slow and incremental work and I think it's separating out what, what's, this is what I would label as like what's chronic shame versus what is feeling inadequate in a given moment. So I feel inadequate like nine times a day, right? Like <laughs> uh, coming here, um, you know, I can have really tough sessions where I'm like, do I know anything? Do I know anything about being a couples therapist? Like, did I forget everything I've ever learned? I mean, inadequacy happens all the time. For me, it's just a normal experience. But chronic shame is where like we genuinely think that we're not worthy often and that's when someone doing anything slightly, anyone not liking something that we do, even a little bit, can activate that fear of, am I not worthy? Am I not an okay person? And I think that's where you really, I think working with a therapist is the most beneficial because they're the ones who help you separate out, like in this very sticky tar pit of chronic shame that is just gonna wrap around you every chance it gets. How do we separate out What's sadness? What's anger? What's fear? What's trauma? How do we separate that out and work with those components? So that's kind of a, a maybe a general answer. I don't know if it's helpful. It's good. Good. Okay. Do you know any good therapists? Insert plug here. <laughs> I know lots of good therapists. Um, they are generally in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, but <laughs> but I, I um, am happy to uh, offer some suggestions of how people can find therapists if that would be helpful. I saw your website, yeah. great, great messaging. It pulls you in and it's, it's great. So oh, throwing good. that in there. Oh, good. You've got Randy on the hook. It's like <laughs> All right. He's, he's being reeled in. All right. right. Thank yeah. you. I, I just came back recently from Berlin. Mm-hmm. When, when I asked the audience there in attendance, is talking about feelings, is the idea of seeking help from a therapist, is this a normal practice here? Mm-hmm. And they quickly said no and no. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about the stigma. Mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. for for many many years, I think the image that a lot of people have is if you go see a therapist, you must be broken, mm-hmm. and we're okay getting help from every kind of broken except for if we're mentally broken. Yeah, I know. Because it says like, oh, there's something defective about us, and we'll avoid this. Mm-hmm. We've had guests on our show before, supremely talented individuals who have suffered through some serious, just beyond belief, shocking like you don't want to watch that movie. Yeah, uh, abuse. Mm-hmm. And then I asked them off air. You ever think about going to see a therapist? Nah, I survived. I'm okay. Yeah. So there's a lot of resistance around this. Like mm-hmm. physical, like you cannot believe, like getting hit with objects, abuse. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So can we talk about the stigma behind therapy, what it is, what it isn't, and then maybe just have, maybe normalize it mm-hmm. that sure. it's totally okay? Yeah. Well, I think there's there's two reasons people don't go to therapy. One is stigma and judgment, and the other is fear, because it's really, really frightening to think of going into emotions and trauma. So I'll speak to both. So with the stigma, yeah, I think, I think that is changing, at least here culturally, where there's less stigma about seeing an individual therapist. I think couples therapy is still pretty high in the stigma category where people feel like ashamed if they need a couples therapist. But what, what is therapy, right? So therapy is talking to someone who's gonna do their best to understand and care about you and maybe help you look at yourself in a different way and help you think about things in a way that move you through blocks. So. In my world, I'm like, that's amazing. For an hour, someone's just going to focus on me and they're just going to like listen to my feelings and like they're not coming with like anything that happened to them that week and they just want to know about me and I can talk about anything I want and it's not judged. So that's if you see a good therapist. Um, 
yeah, I mean, I think therapy is amazing. It feels so good um, to just feel like you have time and space for someone to just want to get to know you. Um, the fear part, though, the fear part is really tough because if you've dealt with trauma your whole life by keeping it in a box and saying, I'm fine, I've moved on, that's been a very good coping, right? That coping has helped you survive. That's great. Like, you needed that. You needed to be able to put that trauma in a box and not be defined by that and move forward. The hard part is, is when we start to hit where compartmentalizing out pain is not working anymore in your life, right? It's not, you're, you know, feeling really anxious, you're feeling depressed, your relationships are suffering, your ability to hold down a job is suffering maybe. And that's where, you know, I think people start to say, okay, like, is this, is this bad enough now that I would go see a therapist? So to, to work with that fear a little bit, I just want to help you understand that therapists understand how scary it is. Like a good therapist is not on day one going to just hold your head underwater into like all of the crap you don't want to think about or feel and be like, yeah, feel it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you got to save something for session three and four. Right. right? I mean, not in right. session one. <laughs> right. um, we go at client's own pace. I mean, I have clients I've sat with for four years who are not ready to open up some of those boxes. And I'm fine with that. Wow. We are going to chill in this space until it feels safe enough to open that box up. Because every minute, even though it looks like standing still, every minute is that person's mind bringing themselves to more readiness to try to open that scary box. But oftentimes, especially if you've had trauma, You've never had someone who you really feel safe enough with, like to trust that a therapist isn't gonna judge you, sometimes takes a long time. And that's fine too. Like I always laugh when I hear people say like, you have to tell your therapist everything or be honest. I'm like, no, lie to me. I don't care. Do what you need to do. Wait it out, see how I am, take time. See if you can trust me, give me kernels, test me. That's fine, you have to, you have to, you have to, know for yourself that you can trust me. That's fine. I don't care. <laughs> so, yeah. Don't be so scared of therapists. We're not going to hurt. Or good ones won't. Some bad ones will. Don't go to them. <laughs> okay. Somebody said online there's a third barrier besides stigma and fear of expressing Ooh. feelings. Mm -hmm. Price. Yep. Okay. That's, so this is almost where you come in with a designer piece, right? Like, what is the value of therapy, right? So in the first video I ever saw of yours that I loved so much that it made me an addict of the future, you talked about if someone can only afford a certain amount, you're only getting paid a sandwich, right? The same with therapy. I see clients for free. I'll do that. I have a certain amount of clients I'll see for free or at a really adjusted rate. So. If you contact a therapist and you say, this is what I'm looking for, this is my issue, I truly cannot pay more than this, can you take that on? Do it. Um, this is kind of a sneaky tip, but pay for the first session, because for me, like in that first session, I'll fall in love with you and I'll see you for any price, <laughs> because I'm like, oh no, I love you, I'll totally keep seeing you for free. Oh no, um, no, don't do that. <laughs> People, okay, keep going. I'll, I'll, but I'll. truly, like, you know, let them let them get to know who you are, and maybe, maybe it will make them a little more flexible in the price. Um, there's, there's a website that I can give you the link of, um, it's called Open Path, so tons of therapists are on Open Path Collective, they see clients for um, $30 to $50 a session, no insurance, so that's cheaper. Um, for anyone watching who's on any kind of school campus, you should have free counseling through colleges. And uh, yeah, so I think those are, those are the approaches for that. But I would also say, really think about what, what the value of better mental health is or a better relationship um, with couples therapy you have the easy price barrier over here of divorce, which is so hugely expensive, right? But yeah, I think it's about sitting with what the value could be. And sometimes you don't know until you try. So you have to try it, but. Yeah, I think this is a general mindset issue mm -hmm. that people are just super thrifty. Mm -hmm. And some people will drive across town, wait in a long line, buy in bulk, 
to save 35 cents. Mm -hmm. And that's okay, that's what you wanna do. If you have more time than money, that's what you do. Mm -hmm. And when you count up your life and the hours that you spent doing these things, you may realize you might not have spent the most valuable thing that you have, which is time mm -hmm. wisely. Mm -hmm. So if we say that if you learn something new, let's say you learn a new trick in Photoshop and it saves you 30 seconds every time you do that task. You multiply that out by every time you do that, and you're gonna see the value in that. And people would invest. If you're at the gym and you're, you're kind of new and you don't know what you're doing and you, you get a personal trainer, we don't think about that. Like we do that all the time. Mm -hmm. And your, your subscriptions to Netflix, to Amazon, to all these things, you spend all the time because culturally it's okay. Everybody's doing it. There's millions, hundreds of millions of people doing it. Mm -hmm. But oh, I have a mental block mm -hmm. about talking about value or self-worth. That's not worth anything. Sure. That seems insane to me. Right? You should spend as much money as you can afford on personal development, whether that's through therapy, through reading, mm -hmm. through coaching, mentoring, mm -hmm. because it's going to pay back in exponential terms. If you can't come to grips with that, okay. We'll see everybody else. I don't know, because the world's not that bright. I don't know what else to say about that. Yeah. If no. you don't want to invest in yourself, well, okay. And my only answer to that is, how's what you're doing working out for you right now? Because everything, there, there's a decision to be made, right? Right. It, and if you love what you have, go for it. Just keep going for it. Just double down on that. It's working. It's amazing. But to continue to do the same thing over and over again and, and expect a different result, that's insane. Mm -hmm. Now, I have a question for you. Okay. The premiere of the HBO series Watchmen is coming. And I think okay. one of the lines is, who watches the Watchmen? Mm -hmm. who, who's the therapist of the therapist? Do you see a therapist? So that's a really good question. So in, in different seasons, I definitely see my own therapist. Um, I generally like have something come up where I'm like, oh, this is one that I can't do on my own. I want to see a therapist. And I really enjoy that. But what I do constantly is supervision. So I um, have, I, with permission, I record my sessions. And I watch with a supervisor and they watch me and they make sure that I'm doing it right and doing it well. This is something very few therapists actually do. Like after grad school or licensing, people drop off and don't do that. But supervision is also its own kind of therapy because you're processing countertransference, which is like how I feel about the client. You're processing, you know, a lot of things. So, but I love therapy and I'm always excited when I have, I'm like, oh good, I get to go to therapy now. Yeah. <laughs> I got something to work through. Right. So you're not only the CEO, you're also a client. Yes. <laughs> okay, beautiful. I, I love that you actually record your sessions to watch back. It's something that we talk about quite a bit here. Mm -hmm. If you guys are on a sales call, record mm -hmm. your call. Mm -hmm. uh, you, this is private. It's just for you to understand where you, you lean into biases that you have, mm -hmm. where you may not have listened and you had an agenda and then playing it back, especially after some time, you get detachment mm -hmm. you're like you're able to separate you in the moment the person and you can more objectively look at that and it's super helpful athletes do it almost everybody watches game tape mm -hmm. and that's kind of what you're doing and i recommend it to everybody oh and i i i want to take what you're saying and then put it on like a megatron because so i don't know if you've heard of the book peak um which is about like deliberate practice and expert performance I mean, everything you talk about is aligned with those values, but it's an amazing book if anyone wants to read it, Peak. Um, so he studies like what makes the best violinist and dancer and athlete and whatever. And what deliberate practice does is they also study what doesn't work, right? And the thing is, is so this is, this is the scary data. Most therapists and doctors over time rate themselves as improving, but all the research says we just get a little bit worse. We wow. don't improve. So time spent doing something does not improve it. Deliberate time spent doing something improves it. And why, how to make something deliberate is to make sure that you're not using yourself as the evaluator, mm -hmm. right? Because we all will bias that, our, that we're doing better than we're actually doing, including therapists who are, you know, you would think are better at like judging themselves or how their performance. So that deliberate practice what chris is saying about recording your sales calls i would guess most people watching this are going to feel like i don't want to do that like that's very very uncomfortable and let me tell you 
It is enormously uncomfortable. I hate it. I hate watching it. I, d I have not gotten more detached over time. I hate it. I hate watching myself do something that I could have done better. But it's the only way. So if you can force yourself to do it with a coach, with, a, with someone that you trust, um, someone who knows more than you, it's hugely beneficial. Very good. I think that's a great way to end this session. I think you and I are going to talk about something else later. But oh, yeah. I, I want to thank everybody that's tuning in on our live stream. And mm -hmm. we will drop the uh, links to the book references that, that Wesley brought up mm -hmm. uh, using my, our Amazon affiliate link. Yeah. <laughs> We're on it. We're so on top of that. And then I also want to thank all our pro members who are tuning in live. Uh, via satellite or whatever, via the internet, and everybody made their way here. Thank you very much, and just thank you for doing this. And I oh, just, yeah. I'm, I'm thrilled to talk to you and and continue this dialogue with you. Maybe we can we can do a public service by normalizing that we we all could use a little help, mm -hmm. and and to remove whatever stigma and cost value price attachment to this because it's necessary work. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Thank you, thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>